so I'd like to welcome everyone to MTRI's April Sitback Seminar. My name is Chad Simmons, and I'm an ecologist here at the Mersey Topiatic Research Institute. Uh, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that MTRI is in, and we are meeting from Gespuik, one of the seven districts of Mi'kmaq, homeland of the Mi'kmaq people. We acknowledge the treaties of peace and friendship, and we want to thank the Mi'kmaq people for their generosity in sharing their homeland with us. So for anyone unaware, MTRI is a research-based nonprofit, and we are nestled in southwest Nova Scotia near Kejimakujik National Park and National Historic Site, and within the southwest Nova Scotia Biosphere Reserve. Our mission is to promote, conserve, and sustain biodiversity in Gespuik, as well as beyond. So tonight, I would like to welcome Rebecca Stevens-Green, PhD candidate at Dalhousie University. University. Uh, Rebecca is one, uh, one member of the LaBroche lab and is studying the factors controlling the biological carbon pump or the BCP in the Northwest Atlantic and Labrador Sea. Specifically, she collects environmental DNA and studies the genetic makeup of the microbial communities in the Labrador Sea. She is also interested in bioethics, scientific communication, and using scientific research to develop policies that can mitigate climate change. So next, I'm going to hand this seminar over to Rebecca, but I'd like to remind everyone to please keep your mics muted. And if you have any questions during the talk, please type them into the chat window. We also have a dedicated question period at the end of Rebecca's presentation, and that will give you the chance to ask your questions live. So with that, Rebecca, it's up to you. Sweet. Um, I'll just say, I don't know if I can see the chat, so if you could just give me a wave if there's any questions. Um, yeah, I can let you know. Perfect. All right. So hi, everyone. Um, it's really great to be here online today and get to share a little bit um, about the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Microscopic, Microscopic Universe Under the Sea. Um, my name is Becca. I'm a PhD candidate in Julie's lab at Dalhousie University in the Department of Biology. Um, and yeah, I'm hoping to give you a bit of a talk that will be your guide to starting to learn about and understand the tiny microscopic creatures that help make our world go around. Um, so just a really brief introduction uh, about me. Um, so I am in my second year at Dal uh, in my PhD, um, but before that I was actually working at uh, the University of Guelph, uh, or completing my bachelor's at the University of Guelph. Um, and when I was there, I kind of got interested in microbiology by joining a microbiology lab. Um, we were mainly studying fungal genetics and trying to knock out um, with CRISPR um, genes that were causing disease um, with these fungal pathogens. Um, but I kind of decided I wanted to do something a little different um, for grad school, which is how I ended up moving out here um, to Nova Scotia near the ocean for the first time ever, which has been really lovely. Um, it's also just giving me the chance to um, not only appreciate the ocean, but also to study parts of it. Um, so this involves a variety of day-to-day -day activities that I'll talk a little bit about um, near the end of my talk, um, but sometimes it means going on a boat for a whole month, um, and then sometimes it means looking at brown water in the lab. So um, yeah, that's a little bit about me, and we'll get started. Um, so here's the ocean. Um, so I first wanted uh, to give everyone a couple of seconds to think about what the ocean means to them. Um, if you want to, you can write something in chat. I'm not sure if I can see it, um, but even just to share with each other. I'll just give everyone a couple seconds. Um, so some of you might be writing about um, how the ocean is significant to you. You might be thinking about it as a source of food. Um, as a connection to the outdoors and other ways, waterways around us. Maybe you're thinking about a sport you do near the ocean or some outdoor activities you do. Um, or maybe you're thinking about the things that live there like whales, dolphins, and crabs. Um, but for me, what I'm usually thinking about when I'm thinking about the ocean is um, the things that I can only see with a microscope, um, which is weird because I, don't see them unless we take samples. So um, yeah, I'm just hoping to let you in on a little bit of what I do through that today. 
Um, so before I get started, I want to quickly go over one of the main ideals I'll be focusing on during the presentation. Um, and that is the question, what is a microbial community? Um, so microbial community is defined as groups of microorganisms that share common living space. Um, so basically it's like living with roommates, except in this case, there are billions or trillions of roommates. Um, I would not want to do the microscopic dishes in this household. Um, yeah, but essentially uh, microbes are an essential part of the web of life. Um, and they're involved in a whole bunch of um, activities that can lead to positive and negative uh, consequences. So they're involved in our human microbiome that can have like a positive impact, like with our gut microbiome, but it can also lead to negative health co consequences, especially in the, if there's one pathogen kind of overpowering the human body. Um, they're also found nearly everywhere on earth, including the terrestrial environments, um, extreme environments like hydrothermal vents and the ocean microbiome, which is the which is the environment that the microbes live that I'll be talking about today. Um, it's also important to note that microbes uh, perform a variety of roles in the different environments. Um, so for example, in soil, um, the microbes will decompose organic matter and cycle the nutrients in the soil, uh, making it healthy for everything to grow. Um, within the human body, like I said before, um, the microbial communities or microbiota are often involved in digestion and our immune systems and other physiological processes in our bodies. But in aquatic environments, uh, microbial communities are essential components of the food web and are also responsible for carrying out important biogeochemical processes, um, such as nitrogen fixation and carbon cycling. Um, so I want to introduce you to two of my favorite community members um, from this microbial community. So in the ocean microbiome, there are a variety of key players, um, including bacteria, fungi, viruses. Um, but the key players I will be focusing on in my talk um, are the plankton species, including phytoplankton and zooplankton. So phytoplankton are microscopic plant-like organisms that photosynthesize just like plants on land do, and they're the um, primary producers of the marine food chain. Um, they're responsible for producing a large portion of Earth's oxygen, um, which is not talked about too much. Um, I think it's a, it's been calculated to be around 50%, but I think that number is slightly changing. Um, and phytoplankton are composed of different players, including um, Diatoms, which are characterized by their silica shell walls and form these like really beautiful, beautiful uh, crystal-like structures. Um, they are also dinoflagellates that are a group of phytoplankton, um, and these are basically algae that use flagella to move through the water. Um, and finally, another group of phytoplankton is cyanobacteria, which are essentially bacteria that are capable of photosynthesis. In contrast to the plants, there are also the animals, uh, the microscopic animals of this world. Um, and zooplankton are the small, drifting, animal-like organisms that consume other planktonic organisms, including phytoplankton that I just mentioned, and also other zooplankton. Um, and zooplankton can be classified into different groups, um, and they include things like copepods, krill, and also jellyfish. So there's some non-microscopic uh, organisms that are also considered zooplankton. Um, so unlike phytoplankton, the zooplankton are heterotrophic, I mean, they're just like that, us, and they cannot produce their own food and must rely on other sources for sustenance. So let's dive in a little bit more um, to phytoplankton. Uh, there's lots of reasons I personally think you should care about phytoplankton, um, which I definitely may be biased since I study them all day. Um, but here is our four reasons um, that I'm going to argue to you that you should care. So the first one is that there are many cool and unique species um, that have evolved very differently. Um, so just interesting characteristics in evolution. Second thing is that they are the base of the ocean food web. So if you care about things like fish, whales, dolphins, crabs, um, anything that basically lives in the ocean environment, uh, phytoplankton are a part of that process by nature. 
Um, the third reason is that there are some uh, phytoplankton or algae blooms that can actually have negative impacts on us in the environment. And I'll talk that, about that a little bit more. And finally, um, the one I'm most interested in is that phytoplankton um, can also help the ocean with its job as a carbon store or carbon storage unit. So I wanted to touch on um, a couple of the unique and diverse phytoplankton species. There are tons out there um, and they're incredibly diverse, but I just chose um, two to talk about um, to introduce you to them. So the first intriguing species is uh, Cagecerus uh, debilis. I don't know if I'm saying any of these right. Um, and this is a diatom that has spines uh, that you should be able to see on the slide kind of uh, coming out of the chain. Um, and it's thought that these spines actually may help deter predators or prevent other planktonic organisms from grazing on the diatom, since it can potentially cause damage to the predator and just spike them. So it's kind of cool defense mechanism for something that's floating in the water and doesn't really have much defense. And then the second uh, species I want to introduce you to are, is Noctiluca scintillans. Um, and this is commonly known as the sea sparkle. Um, and it is a dinoflagellate that causes a bioluminescent glow, um, usually near coastal areas. Um, so if you ever see this, um, it's usually a dinoflagellate bloom. Um, and that's just one species that does it. So phytoplankton are also um, the basis of the marine food web. Like I said before, they are primary producers, just like plants on land. And they're considered the foundation of the aquatic food chain. Um, through the process of photosynthesis, which I've just on, outlined here as a reminder, um, they can take up carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight and convert it into organic matter and oxygen. As they grow and reproduce, phytoplankton are basically providing a continuous source of nutrients um, for higher trophic levels, such as zooplankton, small fish, and other marine animals. Um, and then after this, those species also provide food sources for higher trophic levels. Um, so phytoplankton are ultimately the first link, um, which makes them essential to maintain an ocean ecosystem. And also an interesting question to um, look at them since they kind of start everything in the ocean ecosystem. Um, so the third uh, reason I think you should care about phytoplankton is they actually have a dark side. Um, and not all algal blooms are harmful, but some are depending on uh, the species and the amount that it, it accumulates. Um, but phytoplankton are able to form these harmful algal blooms or HABs, um, which you might've noticed sometime when you're camping in a provincial park or taking a hike, sometimes there's signs if there's been um, like a harmful algal bloom in the area to make sure not to um, like let your dogs in the water or drink the water. Um, just because they have some really harmful toxins. Um, these blooms that are harmful can basically lead to oxygen depletion um, because they're taking it all up, fish kills, and ultimately the protection of harmful toxins. Um, and these toxins are no joke, so they can cause a wide range of health problems in, from like just skin irritation to respiratory issues, um, to serious conditions, like if you're eating um, shellfish and it has like some of the phytoplankton toxins from a harmful bloom, um, it could lead to paralytic shellfish poisoning and amnesic shellfish poisoning. Shellfish poisoning. Um, the causes of these blooms are complex and can include factors like nutrient pollution, warming waters due to climate change, and ch changes in ocean chemistry. Um, but more research kind of needs to be done in this area to fully know. And then finally, um, phytoplankton are able to help with the carbon removal me mechanism of the ocean through something called the biological carbon pump. And this is basically the process where phytoplankton take up carbon dioxide, convert it to organic matter, and then sink to um, in some capacity find their way to the ocean floor, um, carrying the carbon they absorbed with them. Um, yeah, and I will talk a bit more about this uh, later on. So that's just a brief introduction. So um, 
I wanted to just uh, give a bit of perspective on the significance of the ocean for carbon cycling. Um, so phytoplankton specifically are responsible for around 50% of global photosynthesis. Um, and they're also involved in the biological carbon pump. Um, but it's also important to note that by current estimates, um, the ocean as a whole, so this is not just the biological pump, but also the other um, carbon pumps, um, the ocean has actually um, probably removed around one third of carbon dioxide that has been produced by humans through anthropogenic climate change. Um, so yeah, I think it's really interesting and an important um, question to investigate, definitely. So how does the ocean store carbon? Um, there are different carbon pumps um, and they're classified in usually three main groups. So there's the biological carbon pump, um, which I mentioned before, which is our phytoplankton friends, somehow that biomass being um, translated, uh, getting to the bottom of the ocean floor and sequestered. Um, but there's also the solubility pump, um, which is a chemical pump which basically means um, when carbon dioxide is just uh, dissolving in the water and somehow that um, water sinks. And then um, there's also the, the physical pump, which just reversed to the movement of water masses within the ocean, so um, which can then transport the carbon from the surface to the deep layers in the ocean. Um, so a little bit about the biological carbon pump specifically, um, there's kind of three main things I want to touch on. Um, so the first step of this is the autotrophic phytoplankton photosynthesize and will convert the carbon dioxide into organic matter um, and use that as energy for themselves. Once um, this carbon dioxide is converted to the organic matter in the phytoplankton, the carbon can be transported below the mesopelagic zone um, and sink to the deep ocean. Carbon is exported in a variety of ways. So for example, um, it can be through physical process, like I said, through ocean circulation, um, the gravitational pump, which involves basically the sinking of particles. Um, usually there are aggregates that sink um, larger particles. And then there's also uh, vertical migration, which is when organisms like zooplankton um, or organisms at higher trophic levels basically swim down um, and transfer the carbon that way. Um, so now you know a little bit of background about phytoplankton, I want to um, talk about a little bit um, about where the field is at, at least from my perspective. Um, so I think now we're at a time where we do know a lot more about uh, the phytoplankton species that exist, um, but there are still new discoveries being made and also the classification. So basically when you're, um, when you look at an organism in a certain way and then put it into a certain taxonomic group um, and name it something, um, some of that's being rewritten still. Um, so I think further investigation of all the species um, will only find like more interesting Things that are happening. Um, and then additionally, we're still using some uh, of the technologies that were being used um, at the very start of phytoplankton research, like microscopy. Um, but we've also adopted kind of new technologies um, like flow cytometry, um, which was um, still a bit older, um, where you're basically uh, measuring the size of cells and then counting them, and you're able to classify them based on their size and fluorescence. And um, the one I'm going to touch on most is now we are using um, things like genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, transcriptomics, where we're basically actually looking at the biological molecules um, that exist in these uh, species and also um, communities as a whole. Um, and there's still a lot of unknowns in the field. Uh, so one of them um, that we're still trying to figure out is like how um, microbial interactions work, um, especially with things like mixotrophic species, um, where they can both photosynthesize and uh, eat other organisms, and the relationship with these microbes to carbon export. Um, 
And then um, because you have to go out on a boat and study these things uh, to get an idea of what's happening in different areas, um, the spatial, so location of blooms and species, and temporal, so the time of year um, of those groups, uh, is highly variable. And we still don't really know everything about that variability. We have a good sense, but um, still a lot to be investigated there. And then I think with a lot of people's research nowadays, um, there's a big change happening to our planet with climate change, um, and we don't necessarily know how um, the changes to the ocean because of climate change will affect these organisms. So there's a decent amount of research trying to investigate that um, and also try and create baselines so that we know what's changing. Um, so I want to dive into a little bit about why I do. Um, so I'm just one very small part of this big research community. Um, but I want to talk about a little bit about um, what a group of us did last summer, or last spring, May to June. Um, so basically, our, my research goal um, when I went on board um, was to characterize the microbial communities involved in the biological carbon pump in the Labrador Sea spring bloom. Um, so the spring bloom happens usually every spring, and we went kind of searching for the bloom uh, on the boat. So the Labrador Sea um, is the selected study area for a variety of reasons. Um, it has been uh, told that the Northwest Atlantic Ocean is the most long-term carbon sink in the world per square meter. Um, I think that's uh, based on a few different calculations, um, but basically the Northwest Atlantic Ocean is a large carbon sink and does have these big blooms every year. Um, and it's also a site where there is deep water convection, uh, meaning that this, when the surface water becomes very cold and has a lot of uh, salt in it, so it's really dense, um, the dense water will sink down to the bottom of the water column and can create a flow of water. Um, and this process is important for distributing heat and nutrients. Um, and our understanding of biological carbon pump and the spring oil blooms in this area is fairly limited. Um, so we're trying to fill that gap while having many different researchers doing many different things to try and um, bring a story together. Um, so how do you capture a bloom? bloom? <laughs> Um, and capture these phytoplankton communities? Well, you usually end up going on a boat somewhere. Um, so this is our scientific team on the right, and this was all of us on board the boat, and that was the boat we got on. Um, so we ended up getting on the RV Celtic Explorer, and it was in a collaboration between Canadian and Irish scientists. Um, so we got on, and all of us had kind of different goals, um, but all with the aim of capturing the spring bloom from a like chemical, physical, biological perspective. Um, so it was a really neat project where we all kind of came together with our own specializations. So how did we find the bloom? Um, we went around May and June in 2022. Um, so that's in springtime. That's usually when uh, one of the blooms ha happens at that area. And we also, um, our team also used satellite uh, chlorophyll A levels. So looked at where the chlorophyll was to find where the plants were and used glider data to kind of find um, the ge geographical location of the bloom. Um, and then our goal was to track the progression of the bloom over temporal, so over time and spatial um, scales. So in different geographical areas, but all staying kind of within the bloom. Um, yeah, so this was our cruise track. We, um, the stations kind of in the center there in that big clump were um, the main stations we focused on and where the bloom was. And then we went to other stations kind of around as well. Um, so then at every station, uh, we would stop um, and collect uh, about four liters of seawater. I'm um, using a conductive temperature depth um, machine, so a CTD. And the CTD also took a bunch of different measurements, um, such as uh, fluorescence, and this helped us select kind of where we wanted to collect our water based on where the phytoplankton are. Um, and 
during this time, everyone's kind of different, taking different samples of water um, and doing different things with it. Um, but for us, we were filtering on three micrometer and 0.2 micrometer filters, um, and then storing the samples in the MIAS-80 freezer uh, to be dealt with later. Um, and this is basically just a way to concentrate the biomass. So you can see on that filter there, um, it's kind of brown, um, which means there's some phytoplankton on there. And then um, we basically just fold it up, put it in a tube, and then um, analyze it later. So what was um, my general methodology on the boat and then afterwards? Um, well, the main thing was sampling the ocean waters um, from various steps with the CTD. After that, we collected biomass on the three micron and 0.2 micron filters. Back in the lab um, months later, I was able to extract the DNA and sequence the um, 16S and 18S regions. Um, and the 16S, 18S is basically just a marker to determine um, that's unique to different species. So then you're able to kind of determine um, who was there by all the markers and sequencing that area. Um, and then we use a bioinformatic pipeline. So I sit at the computer a lot and um, are able to use different strategies to assess the microbial communities. Um, and with this pipeline, what you're basically able to create is a um, bunch of different, uh, you can make a bunch of different inferences and um, get a lot of information from the data. Um, but one of them that I'll show is a, um, I forget the name, um, basically a plot that shows the uh, percents of each uh, species group or each genus group um, that you found in each sample. Um, and this can kind of tell us what species were at each station and um, how it was changing over time. Um, so I just have a plot of one um, station. So these are all the different um, depths we took from the five meters. So that's five meters in depth and then 50 meters in depth then 70 meters in depth and then 100 meters in depth. Um, and you can see our bloom was mainly dominated by this teal color, um, which is a phaeocystis species. And with further analysis, I found out that the species is actually uh, phaeocystis pouchettii. Um, and that'll kind of be the main species that we're looking at in terms of um, the giant bloom that it formed while we were there. Um, but you can also see that there are different um, genuses in different um, in the different depths in the ocean. So there's more of this um, Thalassosyra kind of in the lower depths, it seems. Um, and there's a few different um, phytoplankton uh, at each depth. But this is just one station and we have about, um, I think around 15 stations. So once I get a look at all of the data, I'll be able to kind of assess um, how it was changing over time. Um, yeah, and get an idea of what was happening while we were out there. Um, so we were able to find with this DNA data that Phaeocystis pouchettii uh, was the dominating phytoplankton species in the bloom. And this is a um, haptophyte species that forms these really large colonies and um, a polysaccharide gel ma matrix. So a lot of time on board, they were kind of clogging our filters as we were filtering them. Um, but yeah, it's like a really interesting species. We don't really know. Um, I, I think it's been hypothesized to be involved in a lot of carbon export, um, but it's a really great chance to examine a huge bloom um, of the species in that area. Um, and we're basically interested in knowing how it changed over time and also um, how the community changes um, relate to the export of carbon, which are measurements done by other people on board. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone who made this uh, research happen, um, my supervisor, uh, lab members, sampling team, uh, filtering with me, Mindy, um, and everyone in the crew and team on board. Um, and then I'm happy to take any questions. And if I don't know the answer, um, you can email me and I will get back to you at some point. <laughs> Great, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, and as she said, does anyone have any questions? You can type them in the chat or uh, just unmute yourselves and ask them yourselves.
I have a few questions, actually. Okay. <laughs> um, do you know what the estimates are for the number of species of phytoplankton in the world's oceans? I know it's a big question. I don't know that one. Um, I think it's hard to say because, yeah, at, th at this point, I don't know what the estimate is, but I think a lot of them are still being um, fully classified. Like, at least when I run my... Um, analyses or something like that like a lot of them oh, sorry come up as like unidentified um so we still don't have like a way to identify them genetically um but I'm not sure what the estimate is I can look that up for you though and let you know uh someone asked is the phytoplankton bloom your sample visible to the naked eye uh no it wasn't I know there's some blooms that you can see like you've seen if you've seen those like NASA photos from space you can see those like huge um blooms but for ours we didn't really see it <laughs> at all um but we just uh would have a lot of problems and that's kind of how we knew there uh, problems with clogging which how we knew there's a lot of stuff there <laughs> basically um uh, do you have any hypotheses about the productivity um i don't that's like the big question i feel like that a lot of people are trying to answer the uh, the question was, do you have any hypotheses about how the productivity of these phytoplankton communities will be affected by ocean warming? Um, I think there's been some studies uh, that have looked at um, like simulated heat waves um, and things like that. But And one of the hypotheses is that um, a lot of the larger species will not be blooming as much and some of the smaller species will. Um, but I think a lot is still unknown. And um, actually to try and get at that question, one of the things we did on board was uh, collect a ton of water and put them in two different temperatures and two different um, nutrient conditions to mimic um, like climate change effects on that area. Um, so we'll get to see kind of um, how the commu community changed in that way. Um, but I also feel like the ocean is such a huge <laughs> body of water compared to 20 liters in like a big tub. Um, so I guess we'll have to see. Um, thanks for the question. I've got another question. Okay. <laughs> How hard is it to like grow these microorganisms in the lab? Because the ocean is a very uh, complex environment. Is it fairly straightforward to replicate it in the lab? Um, so do you mean in terms of like culturing? Yeah. Like to grow them? Okay. Um, there's a lot that are unculturable or that like we've had people in our lab trying to grow something and it just does not want to grow or I've had the organisms I'm working with um like stop growing well in the home I was giving them so I had to like try a bunch of different things so they didn't die um so they're very temperamental I would say and then also some of the um like dinoflagellates like um they have to eat certain organisms, but they only eat certain organisms. So you have to find a way to grow the organism they eat really, really well, and then also grow the dinoflagellate really well. So I think there's like, it's not an exact science. And I think if something works, you just kind of stick with it. <laughs> it's the idea. Hey, if no one else has any question, I have one more. Okay. So cool. like, I'm I'm an ecologist, so I study a lot of things that you can see and you know much more easily measure. So I'm trying to just get my head around what what defines a species of a microorganism. Um yes. <laughs> so I think uh I know the definition like somewhere in the depths of my brain, but I think the idea is that um like species were usually classified based on microscopy. So they'd look at something and then um, identify it based on like the features, like whether it had flagella and they're like only a few people. Well, there's probably more people than a few people, but I don't know very many people who can actually identify them by microscopy because I think we've moved on to different methods. Um, but there's also sometimes species that we're looking at, for example, that with that barcode um, sequence that kind of identifies what they are. Um, 
that basically will have like very small changes in their genome. And sometimes that's because the same species is growing in a slightly different environment. So then it's like slowly adapting um, its genetics and ecology. And they have a really fast um, like reproduction rate. So mutations happen pretty quickly, I would say, relative to us, <laughs> for sure. How fast? Um, how, fa how fast can they replicate? Uh, it depends. I for I think it's like every couple of days or something. I don't know. I I don't know much about the production. Okay, I've got a few. Yes, this is known for disrupting food webs. Um, I'm not too sure about that. I think. Um. Yeah, I guess. Bev, could you explain? Um, what you mean by that? Like, how were they disrupting the food webs? If you have a chance, if you're still here. Oh, well, it's, it's um, Herb Vandermeulen here oh, okay. um, with, with Beverly at home. We, we just got back today from uh, teaching the seaweed course over at uh, Dowell Seaside. So we're right in the middle of that. Anyhow, I thought that Phaeocystis was um, well known for disrupting near shore food webs. In other words, bivalves. Um, don't eat it. They essentially close up. Uh, they find it uh, unpalatable. Okay. I was just wondering whether that happens in open ocean situations as well. Um, not that I know of. I think in that's more of a coastal um, issue. I think in the, but I guess I don't really know. I don't think there've been studies on it because I think it's, um, I don't know if bivalves would live out there. I, I don't no, know. no, no, that, that's, that's what right. I'm, I'm just, I'm just wondering because of the gelatinous matrix, matrix that the colonies occur in, I was curious as to whether maybe copepods or other zooplankton have difficulty okay. feeding on it as well. Maybe that's not the case. Maybe it's fine in open, oh, uh, yeah. open ocean. Oh, no, you're definitely right. Sorry. <laughs> I just was trying to understand where it's coming from. Um, yes. Yeah, so basis of species, um, basically they can exist as like a single um, cell, or they can form these like really giant colonies, like you're saying, um, with the gel matrix. And sometimes um, when they're under like stresses, like predation, they will actually like start to form these colonies. Um, and it's been shown a few studies that like when certain chemicals are given to them, then um, they're like, oh, it's time to form a colony because these are predators that are coming. Um, so I think in terms of that, it like might disrupt like some zooplankton eating them. Um, but what's kind of interesting to us is that maybe because they're not being eaten as much, maybe they're sinking more, um, but we don't really know. So I think we're trying to, but that's a good point. That's something for me to look into too. So thank you. Okay. There's some more. Mm. Okay. And then Keith had another question. I think I'm just reading it. Um, I do not do microscopy on all my samples to... Uh, confirm the proportions of different components of the community. Um, we do a variety of things that are not microscopy, um, including flow cytometry, um, which is when you're like measuring the sizes of cells. And we basically try to put the flow cytometry, the DNA data, um, someone else is doing protein data, and we're trying to like, kind of like put it together to figure out what's there. Um, and the thing with the main caveat to uh, DNA techniques, which is kind of answering your second question, is that with something like microscopy, you can uh, hypothetically be quantitative and say, okay, there were this many cells of this organism here and this many cells of this organism, and like this is the exact amount that they existed in in this one sample. Um, but for DNA, we're basically sequencing um, like copies of chloroplasts or copies of uh, the ETNS gene in these organisms. And because of that, um, we can't really say like there's more of this species in this sample than in this sample. We can only say proportionally, this is how the species are related to the other species um, that we sequence in the sample. I don't know if that makes sense, but basically you can't say there's more of this one because you don't know if there's more of that one or less of everything else. And that one's staying the same. That makes sense. Oh, you were validating. Okay. Um, 
validating it. I think so it's mainly through validating it through um, do you mean like controls? Can you explain what you mean by validating? Just so I can. Yeah, sure. sorry, it's better. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I meant, um, I think you answered that. You said you're doing the flow cytometry and other techniques to try mm -hmm. to, because, you know, you're absolutely right. It, it's very hard to go from DNA data to abundance measures because mm -hmm. there's a bunch of other factors occurring in the Eppendorf tube that, you know, you just can't control. Yeah. Um, so I was just wondering what, what else you did to, and I think you answered that. Okay. okay. So thanks. Sure. Yeah. Our, um, another student who's doing the, so I'm doing the DNA and the RNA side of things. And then we have another student doing the protein side of things. Um, and what's really nice about that is that, um, he can actually get a lot of the, um, quantitative measurements of certain proteins that they're producing. Um, so that might give us a better idea of generally what's there. Um, like they can, for example, target um, the peptide like Rubisco, which is involved in photosynthesis um, and see different quantities of that. So um, that's another way. I think we have um, quite a few like other chemical measurements that also come to play, but in terms of DNA, yeah, it's hard to, hard to validate it, but I, um, we did not have the expertise to go through all those microscopy samples. So um, a little easier to isolate the DNA and send it off somewhere. Great, thank you. Yeah, no worries. Okay, great. Uh, if no one else has any questions. No, okay. Thank you again, Rebecca. That was an amazing presentation. Yeah, I can tell that you uh, are passionate about scientific communication because it's always nice and clear and and very engaging. So thank you. And thank, thank you, you everyone for joining us tonight. And while I'm thanking people, I would also like to thank our funder, the Region of Queens, for supporting us and our seminar series. As always, you can stay up to date with our seminars by following us on Facebook. And if you'd like to watch tonight, if you'd like to watch tonight's seminar again, you can check out our Facebook page or our YouTube channel. And so with that, we want to thank you all one more time. And uh, we hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you. Thank you.